Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we can gather today to worship you and to proclaim you, to, to proclaim Christ, our Lord and Savior. Um, thank you for the brethren. Thank you for giving us another day. We know every day your mercies are new and we can come and draw near to you, Lord. Um, help us, Lord, through your word. Um, help me to present it to your people, Lord, so that they can be helped. We all, we all can be helped um, to serve you more and worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's open our Bible to Hebrews chapter 4, verses 11 to 13. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest, so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the, to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Amen. Today we are looking at part two of uh, what we started last time, the rest of God. Um, last time we saw the promise of entering that rest. And today we, um, we starting in verse 11, uh, it says we need to strive to enter that rest and we're gonna talk about that and the second part would be on the word of God <clears throat> on the word of God um, verse 12 and 13 um, so verse 11 let us therefore therefore in light of what uh, was said from verses 8 to 10 uh, the the author is coming to a conclusion um, the conclusion is strive to enter the rest of God, to enter that rest. Um, if we look at verse 8 to 10 uh, real quick, for if Joshua had given, had given them rest, thank you, brother. If Joshua had given them rest, God would have not spoken of another day later, later on. Let me get some water. Refreshing. Um, so the promise of God did not stop there. Um, actually, they remember when the people of Israel entered the promised land, they were still like fighting the nations around them. They were not at rest. It's like, oh yes, we came into the land and we like we kick our feet up and we relax on the Lazy boy. I don't know if they have lazy boy by then, but um, but they they were not at rest. They were fighting the nations around them. They were um, the Lord said, "I left this nation so that you can learn the, the art of war." Um, and we saw also like they would go into exile whenever they left. They they disobeyed and left God. So Joshua did not give them the rest that was promised. And, and you can think of like a comparison here between Joshua and Jesus. Jesus is greater than Joshua because true rest is found in Jesus Christ. Um, and that was not the rest. When they entered the land of Canaan, that was not it. And in the psalm, the psalm that was quoted throughout this passage, Psalm 95, um, David is saying about entering a rest. That is like 500 years later after Joshua. That means like the rest was still available. So it's not a physical rest per se. It's a spiritual rest um, like we saw also last time. Uh, verse 9. Uh, so then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. There remain a Sabbath rest for the people of God. I like the fact that it says Sabbath rest because it's like rest, rest. <laughs> But um, 
putting in fit, uh, the emphasis there. Um, if you are a child of God, if you are God's possession, the Sabbath rest is for you. If you're not a child of God, you're in trouble. Uh, you would be tormented in hell forever. So we have Christ. He's our rest. We're going to see that uh, later on. And verse 10, for whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. So God created the world in six days, and the seventh day he rested. And you also, before Christ, you were working your way to heaven, but you know what? It was, uh, it, there was no hope because no one can earn heaven by their own working, by their own works. No self-righteous person can never inherit heaven. Why? It's only by the merit of Jesus Christ. So, um, Christ says, it is finished. That was his cry on the cross. Um, we cannot earn God's favor. Only Christ did that. Only the righteousness of Christ imputed to you will earn you heaven. Um, so, so, in light of all this, let us then in verse 11, strive to enter that rest. And some author, they like, they kind of title this verse, uh, um, work at resting, or like uh, labor in order to rest. It, there's like a, the word play, you, you're fighting so that you can have peace. Uh, it's like, there is, no, there is no peace before like winning the war. Um, so, uh, so, to strive, what does that mean? It means to make every possible effort. It means to push yourself, to do your best, to be diligent, to labor. Let me ask you, Christian, are you making every possible effort? Are you pushing yourself? Are you doing your best? Are we being diligent? Are we laboring? Are we striving? What well, you might say, striving to what? Um, but first, I, I want to put this analogy. You know, um, when we go to the water park, they have the famous uh, lazy river, right? Everybody wants to go on that. And you get a tube you, on your back, and everybody's going one way. Um, if you try to go the other way, first they will stop you. It's like, no, 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 you cannot, sir. But if, let's say you manage to do like five or ten steps. You feel the fatigue in your leg, it's burning. So it's like striving is like, um, it's like that. Or even in a real river, which flows downstream, like you can't, it's impossible to go back upstream. So striving is that. Striving is fighting against conflict, something that is opposing you, but you wanna continue no matter what. Give it your best, be diligent. So I wanted, I wanted to use other, play, other verses, uh, other places where it says to strive in the Bible. So I had two examples here. The first one is in Luke um, 13, verse 24. Our Lord Jesus Christ himself said, strive to en enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. So in this verse, uh, I don't think Jesus uh, was telling people they could merit heaven by striving for it. Um, no matter how hard you labor, like I said, sinners can never save themselves. Um, we are saved by grace, through faith, not by works so that no one should boast. Our boasting is in Christ Jesus, and he is the reason why we strive. So entering the narrow gate, here is so difficult. Why? Because it requires a lot of sacrifices in terms of human pride. We are prideful people. Like we want, hey, I did it. Hey, um, they have this story. Like a frog wanted to cross the river after a rain. He couldn't. So two birds came and gave him like a little stick, and he bite on that stick, and they tried to cross him over, like to make him cross over. And a man was like, oh. Our engineers, who did this? And the frog laughs, it's me. But, and why do you open his mouth? He let go and he got into the river and got drowned. So pride 
Like, so that's what the Bible says. Pride comes before fall. Like, we are prideful. And ultimately, any sin that is committed before the face of God, it's, there is a pride as, as, at, at the root of it. So, um, so striving is fighting against our like, sinful nature. When Christ gives you a nature, he changes you. But um, I put here also, like, the flesh is not yet redeemed. We have to fight against that as well. Um, if you are following Christ, Christ says you need to deny yourself, pick up your cross daily, and follow me. This is, this is hard. As sinners, we used to love our sin. We love like the darkness, like the Bible says. Um, but when Christ redeems you, um, now we are fighting against the flesh. We're fighting against our sin. And day by day, we get victory over sin, victory over self. Um, and Paul says, offer your members as instruments of righteousness, right? Did you wake up, wake up this morning and say, um, hands, uh, you are an instrument of righteousness. Um, serve the Lord. I, I mean, we should do that. Like, think of this way. What am I going to do today that really honor the Lord? Or you look in the mirror, lips or mouth. Uh, you are an instrument of righteousness. Worship the Lord. Be, let any conversation coming out of, your, out of you, let it be salt, salted with, salt, let it be seasoned with salt so that it can help someone. Uh, the, the Bible says there is life uh, in, in the word, in your word. So are you building, up, not, not creating life, but like, are you building up someone? How are you encouraging a brother? Are you helping them to move forward? So entering the narrow, narrow gate um, is hard because not only we have our flesh, but we have the world and we have Satan. Satan is always opposing the truth. The world is always opposing the truth. They come up with every type of system, CRT now, or uh, no BLM, or like anything to cause you um, to uh, attacking the, the truth of the word of God. Um, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9.27, he disciplines his body. We need to take the same, we need to do the same thing. Discipline our body. Um, this is a metaphor um, borrowed from games, athletic games. Um, he knocks out any impulse in his body like someone who's like throwing big punches because those impulses can prevent him from winning a soul for Jesus Christ. Um, and he said, I don't want to be disqualified, which also borrowed from um, games. It's like, if you don't meet the requirement, if you don't have the proper training, you will not make it to the competition. Um, you have to have the right standards. Paul is probably referring to like fleshly sin and especially for people who are leading and preaching in the church, but it applies for all of us, every Christian. We need to buffet our body, like he says in the King James, um, so that we, we, can, we we don't become disqualified. That's fighting the flesh. First John two fifteen says, do not love the world. Why? Because if you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. And John tells us what is in the world. The desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life. So whoever loves these things, you are an enemy of the Father. So that's fighting, uh, striving, um, fighting against your flesh. Romans 2, 12, uh, after fi fighting against the world, sorry. Romans 12, 2, do not be conformed, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by, new, by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, what is acceptable and perfect. You need to battle against the world, Christian. So, the, the, the flesh, buffet it. The world, do not be conformed to it. And how about the devil? James 4, 7. Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. I like this verse. Sometimes like, people think they can toy with sin. Like, um, the, the Bible says to resist uh, the devil, but when it comes to like, 
um, sexual immorality, he says flee. Like you cannot fight like I'm a strong man, I can, I, I can fight my loss. No, you need to flee um, that. But that was a footnote. Um, so Christ himself said to strive to enter the narrow door. Um, he is the door. But we have to fight against the world, the flesh, and Satan. Another place, another place I want to take you to uh, where he says to strive is in Philippians 1.27. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come or I, I come and see you, or I am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. So we have to strive side by side for the faith of the gospel. This is a call to live life worthy of Christ worthy of the gospel, worthy of our faith, individually and collectively. Um, in, individually, I'm pushing myself I'm, I'm, because I'm called by God. I, I'm called to belong to him. He is holy. I must be holy. That's individually. I need to um, strive for the gospel, strive because I want to honor God with the way I live my life. Um, and collectively, we are the people of God. We are set apart. We are the church, the called out ones. Um, so we have to, um, like he says in Matthew, like let your light shine so that every man can see your way of living and they can honor and glorify your Father in heaven. So back to our verse uh, 11 here. Um, to strive to enter um, the rest Um, if you can sum up this portion of scripture, you can also say, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. This is meaning like to continue, continually bring something to fulfillment or completion. Um, again, not salvation by works, but because we are saved, we work. We, God prepares, prepared uh, works before the foundation of, of the world so that we, might, we may walk in them. So we do good because we, God gave us a good heart, and out of that good heart flows uh, righteousness. Uh, in Matthew 5, 20 says, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not um, enter the kingdom of God. So we need to strive for righteousness. Um, um, enter, strive to enter. It means to go in, um, to come into, uh, we remember Joseph, Joseph and Mary after they fled to Egypt for two years to e escape um, Herod's infanticide. They came back and they enter the land of Israel. So that's the idea. You, it's, it's like when you, uh, we go on a road trip every year, like go see the family in Florida. And when, when you get to Texas, you're like, welcome to Texas because you're entering the state of Texas. So it's like, it's the same idea to enter the rest of God, to be part of it, to take possession of it. Um, this word is also says, uh, it's, it's also used in Matthew 6, 6, when he says, when you pray, go into your room, enter into your room and shut the door and pray um, to your father who is in a secret. Um, so every time the Bible uses the word enter, it is to enter into uh, for something very important, very a big purpose. Um, so, for the believer, it's every experience they have uh, when they experience the blessing of God, the blessings of God in their life. Um, the Lord says, I will not leave you nor forsake you. This is a promise you can hold on to and you benefit that and you enter into grasp of that. Um, so, this is the word enter. Um, so, what, what are we to enter? The the, the rest, the, the, the Sabbath of God, that's heaven. Um, that's the promised land. And we want to go to heaven, not because the streets are made in gold, not because there is the tree of life, but because we have Christ. We're going to see him face to face. And, and, we, and he said, what we are is not yet manifested, but when we see him, it will be manifested. And I, 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 I can imagine 
I can only imagine. Like when Christ returned in my body, like just change and have like, I don't know, muscles, I don't know, or long hair or, you know, but it's me thinking. But it's going to be something glorious, like the Bible says, incorruptible, like flesh, that, it, uh, it's like sin will not, there will be no more sin. That's glorious. I can only imagine that. But it's going to be so, like, amazing. Um, but, yes, enter the rest of God. Enter the heaven of God. It's, it's the promise. So now let's see, uh, let's look at the rest. What is that? Remember last time, um, I told you the Bible uses uh, those two images to always talk about um, um, a future reward in heaven, um, which is the Sabbath and the promised land. The Sabbath simply means rest, right? And the promised land was the place where Israel was going um, to rest from the wandering in the wilderness, um, and, but both of them were pointing to a greater reality is the rest in heaven with God. If you see back in verse 4, um, um, for he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his work. This expression, for he has somewhere spoken, is like when you say, the word of God says, or the Bible says. So it's, it's, it's his way of saying that as well. Um, so the first thing to note here, it's God's rest. It's not mine. It's not yours. It's his. It's God's rest. He rested on the seventh day. So the seventh day was the day after everything was created, and God looked at his creation and said, it is very good. God was satisfied with everything he had made. It was not because he was exhausted. You know, like, man, like when you think of the universe, it's big. And, but God was not exhausted. And the Bible says the universe cannot contain you. Um, it's, not, it's not like me and you, like we work like, I don't know, uh, two shifts, and we work like Monday to Friday, and we or like whatever your schedule is. And on your day off, like you want to sleep in because you want this extra two hours to, you know, get some more rest. God was not tired. He's like, my work is done. He look at his work, at his work, and he was satisfied. So it was a um, cessation of work, uh, if you will say. God ceased to work. Um, because the work was completed. Um, you know, that rest is like, you know, the kids this day, like when they do something, God created the world and mic drop, you know, like it was like a, a mic drop for God. Like it didn't have to, uh, to do, um, it didn't have to rest, right? Um, so, and we have people nowadays, like they saying, they speaking things into existence. I mean, everything that needed to be created, God created it from the beginning. So uh, they need to stop this nonsense as, uh, nonsense as if they have the power to create things. God created everything that, need, that was needed to be created. Um, so this concept of God rest includes like the completion of all his purpose. Everything God wanted to purpose from the beginning, it was done, right? And everything, like uh, putting in place every cause and effect, like, you know, gravity causing something to fall on the ground. God put all this from the beginning. No man can create anything else because God completed it. Um, but it was not only that. You, you know, in the beginning, you see all this movement of the Godhead in creation, um, the Holy Spirit hovering over the, the face of the deep, um, uh, Christ being, being the word of God uh, is the agent by which the world was created and God the Father wheeling everything into existence. We see this movement at the beginning. After the sixth day, it stopped. They stopped working because creation was completed. Um, and the seventh day was supposed to be a long, indefinite period of time 
there is an author, he said, uh, it's a solemn divine repose, a tranquility of perfection. And so he was supposed to go on and on and on and until men and his fall interrupted it. And Christ says in John 5, 17, my father is working until now and I am working. So God has to come back to work um, to, for our salvation. Um, Christ had to come and die to save us from our sin. Um, so the rest it was the rest of God. The second thing to note is like God wanted men to be part of that rest from the beginning. He wanted men to share blessing with him, uh, to bless in that satisfied state um, with him. Uh, uh, Israel, in their weekly or monthly or yearly uh, Sabbath, they were proclaiming that. Um, and even when they were in the wilderness, God told them, hey, um, I'm going to take you to the land, of prom the promised land. And they, they did not trust God. Um, and we know they failed to attain that because of disobedience and disbelief. So their failure to enter the promised land uh, was because of unbelief and apostasy. But this promise to share with God to share that rest with God was not stopped there. Like, we have it today. Um, like he says in the previous verses, today, if you hear his voice, so today you can enter that rest. Today you can, if you're, not, if you're not a Christian, you can repent of your sin and believe in Christ. If you're a Christian, you need to, today, beware of uh, denying the word of God or doubting the word of God or despising the word of God. All these warnings are all over the book of Hebrews. For the Christian, beware of these things because today you can enter that rest. Be beware of drifting away. So all these warnings are there. Um, I want to quickly um, touch on the Sabbath. Um, I know Brother Taufik did a, a few Q&As about that, and if you want more details, you can go and watch them. But um, today I wanted to uh, tell you a few things quickly. So the Sabbath was a type of Christ. A type of Christ. Israel rested on the Sabbath. Christian, we rest in Christ. Secondly, um, can you hear the gospel in the Sabbath? That's why we don't have to keep it, all right? Um, the gospel is being proclaimed in the Sabbath. Rest. No work. No work. Rest. Enjoy God. Stop working. Same thing for the Christian. Jesus came. He says, Come, up, come to me, all who you labor and are, and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. So rest in Jesus Christ. All the Sabbath, weekly, monthly, or yearly, as we see in Colossians 2.16, um, they were supposed to like, stop at every word, like stop it and focus on relationship with God. Um, and this is what we do now. We focus our relationship, uh, we focus everything to Christ. Like we want to be like Christ. We want to become like him every day, Christ likeness. That's what we strive after. Uh, we want to be like Him. Um, so we can say like the Sabbath um, was pointing to Christ. But if you if you think of the verse where God told them to observe the Sabbath, it also points back to the beginning. So you have the Sabbath; it's pointing towards Christ, towards the Messiah, but also pointing back to creation. Um, Exodus 20, verse 8, 9, 10, and 11. Can someone read that for us? Exodus 9, uh, 20, 8 to 11. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. 
So the Lord gave them the Sabbath so that they can remember creation. They can remember God rested. Um, and by observing or keeping the Sabbath, they were witness for God. They were telling all the nations, hey, we rest on the seventh day. This is pointing to God who rested on the seventh day. Like it's, they were proclaiming the gospel. It's like they were evangelists, if you would say. Like they were proclaiming, hey, God rested on the seventh day, and I want, you to, I want to point you to that God. So Israel was the instrument by which God was preaching to the other nations. Um, but one thing, we don't, we don't keep the Sabbath. Why? Because it was the sign of the Old Covenant. Um, Exodus 31, verse 12. Twelve to seventeen. If you can read it, anyone. The Lord said to Moses, You are to speak to the people of Israel and say, Above all, you shall keep my Sabbaths, for this is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I, the Lord, sanctify you. You shall keep the Sabbath because it is holy to you. Everyone who profanes it shall be put to death. Whoever does any work on it, that soul shall be cut off from among the people. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of solemn rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day shall be put to death. Therefore, the people of Israel shall keep the Sabbath, observing the Sabbath throughout their generations as a covenant forever. It is a sign forever between me and the people of Israel. That in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. Yeah, we see all throughout this, uh, Sabbath was the sign of the covenant. It was uh, God's, um, you know, at Mount Sinai was actually, when he gave the Ten Commandments, he was like talking to them directly. They were at the foot of the mountain. They heard the, the voice of the Lord thundering, and they saw lightning and fire the Lord was telling them, like, hey, one, two, three, ten commandments. And the fourth one was the Sabbath. And this was, you know, like when you have a contract, you have to sign the deed somewhere. Like, you have to sign it. So that was like, this is what sealed that contract. So that was the sign of the covenant. And the Lord is really serious about his, the sign of his covenant. Um, you know, a man was found on the Sabbath in Numbers 15, Right? He was picking up sticks to go light a fire um, on the Sabbath. And the people didn't know what to do. It's like, hey, Moses, what do we do with them? And, the Lord's, and they're like, okay, let's go ask the Lord. The Lord said, he shall surely die. And they killed him. So the Lord take very seriously the Sabbath. That why, that's why he was like, you see the commandment, like you, you should die if you don't observe um, the Sabbath. And... It, Exodus 4, 24, I, I like this, this one. This is another situation. Um, it says that that, that that was when Moses was going to Pharaoh. So on his way, they went to a hotel. They were resting for the night. And before Moses get to the people, the Lord met with him. It says, uh, Exodus 4, 24, at, that, at the lodging place, on their way, the Lord met with him and sought to put him to death. The Lord was going to kill Moses. Why? Then, verse 25, Zippoah took a flint, like a sharp stone, and cut off the son's foreskin and touched Moses' feet with it and said, Surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me. So I guess Moses and Zippoah, his wife, they were having this discussion for a long time. Hey, babe, we need to circumcise the child because this is the sign of the covenant that God made with Abraham. And Zipporah was like, no, I don't want to do it. No, I think, think of, like, if you're married, like, you have a conversation with your wife. But the Lord was, this is the sign of the covenant I made with Abraham. Your son is not wearing that sign. I'm going to kill you, Moses. So the wife was like, oh, this is serious. The Lord is in this thing. So she circumcised the child. So it's to show you God is really about wearing the sign of the covenant. So for us, what is the sign of the covenant? 
he would say two things. The Lord's Supper and baptism. Right? Those are the two ordinances we have um, from Christ. Right? Because what he says, this is the, the new covenant in my blood. And every time we take the Lord's Supper, we proclaiming his death. we proclaiming what he has done for us until he returns. And same thing for baptism. Um, you proclaim that I have died with Christ and I rose again with him. So everything is pointing to what Christ had done. So when someone says, oh, today I sin and there is the Lord's Supper and I don't want to take it. I did something wrong. The Lord died for that sin. You proclaiming his death. He died for that very sin you did that morning. Repent, confess your sin to him and take it. And because you're proclaiming Christ died for me. Christ erased all my sin, even the one you did on the way. So, or someone would be like, I don't want to be baptized. That shows you're not trusting the Lord. You're not obedient to the voice of the Lord. And the Lord take his, the sign of his covenant seriously. If you continue that way, that means you, you, you're not his and you're going to forfeit that rest. So Israel was pointing men to God with the mini Sabbath observance, and we are pointing God to men with Lord's Supper and baptism. Um, verse 11, part, second part. Um, so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. To fall. Uh, sorry, any questions so far for rest and Sabbath? Okay, cool. To fall, it means to fall under. In, and in this case, fall under some condemnation or to fail. Uh, if you remember the, the parable of the, the house that was built on the sand, um, and it says, great was his destruction. That was a sign of judgment. And also, to uh, fall means to fall prostrate. Uh, the three wise men came and fell to the ground and worshipped the child. So that was like adoration. But in this case, it's um, falling under some type of condemnation. Um, and the cause is disobedience. And the word disobedience, we saw it, um, it means um, you, you, don't, you willingly turn a deaf ear to the word of God. There is a verse um, in Proverbs 28, verse 9. That was the verse that kind of the Lord used to uh, cause me to repent and turn to him. It's like, if you turn a deaf ears to my commandments, even your prayers, I hate them. They are an abomination to me. So disobedience, the Lord hate. Uh, it's the, here he says it's an evil, unbelieving heart to show you. Um, so the, the author is saying, like, this can be a, an obstacle, a bar barrier to obtain that rest. And the practical application for us, don't do that. Don't do it. And we saw that last time. Um, so the only thing in the world that can rob you of that rest is unbelief. The people of Israel, they, they had disbelief and they, they, they didn't make it. Our prayer should be, come, O oh Lord, help me to trust you more. I want to trust you more than I did yesterday. We need to lean more on Jesus Christ because he's wonderful. He's worthy of of all our trust, we need to trust in him. So this, the, the barrier to enter that rest is unbelief. So therefore, avoid it at all costs. Strive to enter that rest and avoid disobedience and unbelief. So what are we doing on time? Verse 12 and 13. For the word of God is living and active sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, 
and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And verse 13, no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Verse 12, start with four. Four is a little world, is a little word, but it's a big word. Um, there is a saying, um, God swings big doors on little things. Um, so this is one of them. This is uh, one of these little hinges, hinges of the door, and this big door is hanging on it. What is that big door? The Word of God. So it starts with like, hey, do not, do not miss the, the mark. Do not miss like your goal because the Word of God is judging you. Because you have, you have this complete revelation of the Word of God. Everything is there for you. So therefore, if you do, you're going to fall under the judgment of the Word of God. That's the, that's the logical, um, um, that's a train of thought here. Um, I want, I want to, sh I, I think it's too many of them. I'll, Brother Justin uh, Trevino, uh, Brother Taufik, uh, they do the uh, bivocational pastor. And um, back in 2014, he shared this, um, this email. And, and it, I have a copy here, and I can forward it to you too. Um, he he kind of did a, he compiles verses in the Bible on the Word of God. And just to, um, I can read a few verses here, but his goal in, his, in this email was um, never think that you have too, too high of an esteem for the word of God. Like you can strive for even more. Like, to, like the word of God is like, the more you know, the more you learn, the more you realize, man, this is a wealth of, this is like, this is something to treasure. Um, so I have the email here. So he says, the word of God converts the soul. Psalm, Psalm 19.7. I'm going to just read like maybe 10 of them. Uh, the word of God makes the simple wise. So, again, Psalm 19. The word, the word of God rejoices our heart. Psalm 19. The word of God enlights our eyes. Psalm 19. The word of God, the word of God upholds us when we are stumbling. Job 4, verses 4. The word of God keeps our ways pure. Psalm 119, verse 9. The word of God keeps us from sin. Psalm 119, 11. Revive us. Psalm 119, 25. The word of God strengthens us. Psalm 119, 28. Serves as a lamp to our feet and as a light to our path. Psalm 119. Gives us life. Psalm 119, gives light and imparts understanding to the simple, Psalm 119, endures forever, Psalm 119. In Mark 13, 31, the word of God will never pass away. The word of God sanctifies us, John 17, 17. The word of God is like fire in Jeremiah. The word of God is like a hammer that shatters rocks in pieces, Jeremiah 23, 29. Is like a sword that cuts and pierces hearts. Is sweeter than honey. That was Acts two thirty-seven. The word of God is sweeter than honey, and the dripping of the honeycomb. Psalm nineteen. The word of God is likened like rain and snow that water the, the earth. The word of God accomplishes God's purpose and succeed in the thing that God sent it to do, and so on and so on. This is to give you like an idea of like. I will forward this. This is so beautiful. Um, to give you an idea of how like, the importance of the Word of God, how we should like, have this high regard for the Word of God. Why? Because when the, when the Bible speaks, God speaks. It's God himself telling you his will, revealing his will to you, revealing like, who I am, what I expect for you and helps you. Um, this is for us to just cherish and love and the word of God is beautiful.
for lack of a better word. Um, so the, the author here um, in verse 13 and 14, in verse 13 and um, 12, sorry, um, the author is underlying um, the, wor the, the, the role of the word of God in our perseverance. If we want to continue to the end, the word of God, all these things that I said here should apply to you in your life. Um, the author is pointing to the entirety of the divine revelation of God, both this written word, but also who is the word of God? Jesus. So it's pointing both to the, to the written scripture and also to Christ. Um, some people, sometimes they want to divorce the Bible from Jesus Christ. You know, they would say, I don't need theology. I don't need to know everything in the Bible. Just give me Jesus. This is a misguided assessment. Uh, you know, sometimes when we have fellowship and let's say we go in, like someone has a question in Revelation and some of us are like, they don't want to be part of Revelation. Why? Because it's a, it's a difficult book, but it's the word of God. The, Bible, the first three verses of, of, of Revelation, like, Read it out loud. You will be blessed. Like it's the word of God. Uh, I know there are like strange things we cannot understand, like this beast and that, but it is revealing the, the will of God. We need to love it and cherish it. You need Jesus, but how, how do you learn about Jesus Christ? In his word, in the written word of God. From, you need to know from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22, verse 21. So Christ cannot be divorced from Scripture because our knowledge of Christ about his nature, who he is, his work, they come from the Bible. So we need both. We need Christ and we need to grow in our knowledge of Christ by being good student of the Bible. So we cannot have Jesus Christ apart from the whole witness of the Bible. The two are inseparable. So um, the author establishes two characteristics about the word of God. In verse 12, first he says, uh, it's living and active. This is highlighting the, the, the enduring uh, vitality of the scripture. God is the author of scripture, so it's not a dead book like you read Shakespeare, or it's like, no, oh, that was a good story. But no, it's, it's speaking to you. It's like, you see yourself there. Um, God is, God gives life, scripture gives life. And as we see throughout scripture, when God speaks, God acts, he, actions follows. Same with the word of God. The word of God acts in, upon our life, upon our heart. It does something. He pierce, it energizes. He makes us alive. So because scripture is the word of God, it is living and is life-giving. It gives us life. It accomplishes everything that God wills. Um, we just read it in Isaiah. My word that comes from my, mouth, from my mouth will not return to me empty, but will accomplish that everything I please and will prosper in what I send it to do. Isaiah 55, 11. So the second thing, the author describes scripture as sharper than a double-edged sword. Um, as a sword, uh, it can penetrate and separate the soul and the spirit, joints and marrows. Uh, so the Bible is able to judge my thoughts, my intentions. The Bible is able to judge your thoughts and intentions. John MacArthur described uh, this passage as it's an incisive dagger that can make the accurate cut in the, in the accurate place. Um, he says, like a knife would go in and thrust itself right through the joint and marrow, so the sword of the word of God penetrates into the innermost part of men and become a judge and discerner. So the, the Bible, the word of God reveals what's inside. And you kind of use the, this analogy, God just put it there and start moving things. Oh, Pride, lust, 
love of money. Like God is like removing all that with the word of God, with his, the sword of the spirit. So the Bible analyzes the facts of our life. The Bible is our critique, is our judge. Um, when we come to the Bible, let us, let us not come to, um, with our own hermeneutic, like we want to analyze, oh, the Bible says this, but look, we need to come humble. Understand that it's, it has authority. We need to submit to that. Um, so don't come to the Bible to, to speak to it or to read it, but let the Bible read itself to you understand like, hey, this is God's word. God is speaking to me. And in, in verse 13, quickly, the author shifts from the word of God to God himself, which shows the intrinsic link between God and scripture. So just as God's word graciously reveals God to men, it also makes sense that Man is accountable before God as a judge. So that's why he says, to whom we need to give an account. So the Bible shows us the beauty of Christ, the beauty of God, and says, God, you holy, and I'm wretched. Save me. And we realize we're going to answer to God for everything we do. On the last day, all the books will be open. And every single deed like we committed in this life, like Kenzie, you did this, you did that. But there's another book, the book of life. And your name is there. Because if your name is not there, you will be thrown into the fire of hell. Um, so, application here. The Bible is the very word of God. Um, like he says in um, uh, 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 13, um, when Paul says, we also thank God constantly for this, that you received the word of God, which you heard from us. You accepted it as not word of men, but as what is really it, as what is real, it is really is, the word of God, which is at work in you, believers. We need to esteem the word of God. We need to give it the... Uh, the value that um, he deserved. The Bible discerns our thoughts and intention. Um, the Christ says in, in Matthew five, 15, sorry, Matthew 15, 19, out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, uh, thieves, theft, false witness, and slander. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? God says, I know it. I search the heart. Only God knows it. And his word is there to search us, to see what's in us. David says in Psalm 119, search me, O Lord, and see if there is any one way in me and lead me into the way everlasting. Um, one pastor says, um, the Bible is a two-edged sword. Because when you preach the word, when you preach the word, um, it's quick and sharp. It's an edged sword because it will cut through the congregation, but also it, could, it will cut through your heart as well. So when you preach the word, it's like you're preaching the people, but you're preaching to yourself as well. You need to submit to it. And our brother, is a, we, we know his heart is, is a perfect example of that, and we need to follow his example. Um, so another, another application, our life is an open book before God. We're going to give an account to him. Um, so when we pray, do we try to like, hey, God, I'm praying for this, but are you trying to hide your motives when you pray? Guess what? He knows what you're praying for. So confess it. Be open. And if you doubt, Lord, I'm doubting. Help me. Like this guy, like when he said, please, Lord, help my unbelief, like. Tell it to the Lord in prayer. God gives us the gifts of scripture so that uh, we will not follow the example of um, Israel and their disobedience. The Bible is our guide to trusting God and finding full satisfaction, full rest in him. 
Furthermore, God has revealed the truth about Christ to us in the word. That's why we must be good, stewards, good students of the word of God and maintain um, the Bible should be the center of our life. And every teaching of the Bible should be in our life. It's principle to guide whenever, whatever we do, expenses. We go to the grocery. Why we, and I heard of some brothers in San Antonio, before they go to the groceries, they pray, Lord, I want to spend my money wisely because I want to honor you. So like principle, uh, whatever the Bible says needs to be in the center of our mind because the scripture will lead us to Christ likeness. We will become like the incarnate, incarnate word. Uh, to become like the incarnate word, we must study the inscripturated word. This, this to me, like it's a fancy word for the written down word. We need to know the word of God if you want to become like Christ. I wanted to read, lastly, um, Revelation 19, verse 11 to 16. If someone can read that, this is a description of Christ. Revelation 19, 11 to 16. So here we have Christ coming for vengeance. And if you're not clothed with that linen, you're not his people, your blood will be on his robe, the dripping of your blood, because he's the king of kings and lord of lords. Hopefully that helps you to uh, strive um, to pursue Christ and to cherish the word of God. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your word. We thank you for Jesus Christ. He is our Messiah. He is the one who saved us. And if we can stand before you, Lord, it's all because of him. He died on the cross. He was buried. And on the third day, he rose again. And we want to worship you. Help us today, Lord, to do everything to honor you and honor Christ. We want to be helping our faith. In Jesus' name, amen.